Welcome to Third Fridays, the monthly legal talk show from Lois LLC featuring attorney Christian Cisan. This is the original forum in which real attorneys discuss workers' compensation issues, share their opinions, and engage in colorful conversations. This show showcases diverse perspectives of attorneys handling workers' comp cases, including case law trend, practical litigation strategies, and hot topics. Here's your host, Christian Cisan. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the June 2024 Third Fridays podcast. That's right. We're uh, halfway through the year. Uh, it's amazing that in a few short weeks, uh, six months will be over. Uh, we're in the thick of summer. And if anybody missed last month's episode, uh, we talked about uh, using 300.10C on the front lines of uh, workers' compensation hearings and trials using our due process rights and our requests to cross-examine expert witnesses as a way to provide some value to our clients and avoid the imposition of awards where they can hurt us in the future, such as uh, protracted healing period, compensation rates higher than they should be, so on and so forth. Uh, So that's a great listen if you wanted to uh, recap that. This month, uh, we have a little bit of a different flavor. Uh, Of course, you're going to hear from several talented attorneys just like every month, but the topic is going to be really uh, at the end, what what happens at the end of the case, right? So permanency and maximum medical improvement is something that uh, our clients, our employers and carriers always push for, but the rating of that permanent injury is usually going to be a very, very hot button topic. Uh, How impaired is the person's extremity or loss of wagering capacity? And given that uh, in... Uh, our month, we are taking a very close look at schedule loss of use cases. We thought that a recent appellate division case could really shed light on some important topics. So to welcome to uh, the show back again, right? Uh, today, I have Jeremy Janis and Connor Weatherington. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Hi, thank you. So guys, um, we, you know, we were talking about schedule loss of use uh, this month and There are so many reasons why it is harmful to our employers. You know, you can think of this hyperbolic case where someone alleges a sprain in a shoulder, elbow, knee, foot, and they never miss any time from work. They continue to do their full duty position, never complain about anything. And a year later, just because a doctor uh, wants a referral stream from the claimant's attorney, and because the claimant's, you know, ready to cash in, all of a sudden you see a 20%, 25% loss of use to this body part that was never really considered in terms of the claimant's ability to lose earnings, right? So schedule loss of use uh, is always, always at the forefront of what our clients are thinking about in terms of future exposure and preventative exposure. And this case, uh, Garofalo versus Verizon New York, uh, came out a few weeks ago, uh, at the end of May. And why don't you guys take us through what happened before we got to a trial judge decision, right? So how did the appellate division really clarify the facts? Uh, I know that we've done some digging in terms of the briefs that both parties had submitted since it's an appellate division case and that becomes a matter of public record. But let's start you know, getting us through the timeline, right? How did we get to this eventual decision, starting with the expert reports that are at issue? So in May of 2021, the claimant went to his own doctor, Dr. Harley, and gets a report uh, commenting on maximum medical improvement. His doctor finds that he sustained an 85% schedule loss of use of the left pinky finger and converts it into a 35% loss of use of the left hand. Uh, that he approximated to be about a 40% loss of grip strength. Um, conversely, the claim, the carrier goes and gets an IME from a uh, consultant, Dr. Haher, who originally finds an 85% schedule loss of use of the left pinky finger and converts it to a 35% schedule loss of use of the left hand due to deficits of strength and sensation. Um, the carrier then goes and requests an addendum. It, maybe, 
Maybe, right? maybe, maybe. <laughs> or says, maybe the doctor, right? So what's, why am I saying maybe there, Jeremy? The wording says unsolicited. So it's unclear exactly why the addendum just appeared right. out of nowhere. Essentially. I guess that happens too sometimes, right? Like if you are an expert witness, you, you issue the report that's made uh, or that's requested of you. You realize you made a mistake. We see them sometimes where like, oh, uh, the vendor will go to our client and say, oh, Dr. So-and-so didn't answer these three questions that you asked him to answer. Uh, so we're going to have him issue an addendum free of charge, right? So sometimes I could see that happening, but we were right. So he, he has an unsolicited addendum and, and what happens there? So he's like, wait, wait, my bad. I applied the wrong guidelines. I used the 2012 guidelines. I should have used the 2018 guidelines. So instead of having a 35% schedule loss of use, the claimant is found to have a 50% schedule loss of use. This time based on decreased grip strength and sensory uh, deficits. So we get, we get to this point, right? And just for everybody listening, the, the claim is established for the left hand, right? Uh, it seems like a very real injury where a uh, fiber optic cable fell off the back of a truck and crushed the, the employee's left hand resulting in fractures of the left pinky finger and the left hand itself, right? So this isn't something where we're saying, you know, this guy's a complete liar in terms of his accident. This seems to be a very regular accident. I think that's kind of important for some of the uh, non-industry folk that listen to us, right? <laughs> we don't exist solely to call employees liars, right? Sometimes we're there to just reduce the exposure because their injuries are not as severe as they think they are, right? So... Connor, like when we, when we were discussing this one, you know, you mentioned that the guidelines don't really call for this, right? So what do you mean by that? Can you explain to our listeners what, what the doctors did wrong here? Right. So in dealing with schedule also used the 2018 guidelines implemented by the board is, is our workers comp viable when it comes to, uh, your extremities, you know, your arms down to your fingertips hips down to your toes and, and obviously some face and ear, uh, eyes and some face, <laughs> some face, you know? Um, but here it seems that both doctors misapplied the guidelines because when you're dealing with loading of fingers and hands, loading only applies and converting it to from a, I guess a one digit slew to a hand if multiple fingers are involved. So here it's only, a left pinky claim, uh, but also a hand. So the doctors misapplied the guidelines in that they converted a pinky injury into an overall hand injury, uh, which is improper per the guidelines. It's not one of the special considerations in chapter two, which deals with your fingers or one of the special considerations uh, and the loading tables in chapter three, which is the overall hand and wrist. Yeah. So essentially if you, have two fingers on the same hand that have such a permanent impairment that it would normally affect your ability to have grip strength. So like, you know, think to yourself, like most, you know, most people who, uh, I guess most people can understand this part, right? If you were to hold a baseball in your hand and then all of a sudden one of those fingers couldn't really do anything with that, right? You could probably hold a baseball the same way unless that finger's the thumb, right? So take away the thumb. I probably can't like grip a baseball the same way. Take away any of the other fingers. I can probably still grip a baseball with a decent amount of strength. But if they're saying, well, if you lose grip strength, you're, you're going to lose grip strength if you have such an impairment of two digits. So because that really does affect your hand function, it's not really fair if you have high losses of use of, let's say, the pointer finger and the middle finger, because that affects your hand. So loading, in a sense, makes sense, right? Like it, the concept makes sense, but what you're saying, Connor, is that it just doesn't apply here. Right. There's no, there's no uh, outline or delineation or explicit text in the 2018 guidelines that allow for what the doctors did. So really, both doctors misapplied the guidelines. Yeah. And like, imagine, imagine you actually lose 85% of the function of your pinky finger. 
Would any reasonable human being think that you then lost 35% of the function in your hand? Like that to me, without even thinking about what the guidelines allow for and don't, when you get that first report from the claimant's doctor, my instincts are more, hey, I just let's just cross-examine this guy and put him to his proofs. We don't we actually don't need an expert witness, right? We don't need an IME report to refute that when you have a legal argument. So I think that's one of the things that, you know, when we look at schedule loss of use cases, if you put experts up against each other, they both have the tendency to misapply the guidelines because that's that's a legal conclusion that they'd be making. We really just want them to, to give us the medical findings, right? The diagnoses that lead to special considerations and the range of motion measurements. So I think that if, if that, uh, decision could have been made. One, this case could have been over, right? And two, the exposure would have been lower, right? So the 2018 uh, guidelines that HAHER uses with the addendum now, as you mentioned, Jeremy, results in an increased schedule loss of use. Now, you know, we like to think of ourselves as guidelines experts, right? How do you think that this expert increase the value by using new guidelines. What, what could he possibly have done to go from 85 to 100 for the finger and then 35 to 50 for the hand? The problem is it's not clear on this case. He probably just misapplied the guidelines for a second time. Again, right? Yeah. He misapplied the guidelines again when here you are in May of 2021, the claimant's doctor gives you the bad report. And then in August and then September, you create two reports that a court could look as quote unquote concessions. And then Jeremy, we get to the actual hearing or trial portion of schedule loss of use. How does the law judge make a determination? You have a 35% report from the claimant using 2012 guidelines, a 35% report from the employer and carrier using the 2012 guidelines and a 50% report from the employer carrier using the 2018 guidelines. What did the law judge make of that? So in this one, the law judge essentially saw that two of the doctors agreed and said, I'm just going to go with that 35%. Yeah. Is it some, some way of just saying, what are we doing here? Right? Like the experts initially agreed. I'm just going to put that opinion in there. And I think Connor, you, you found like a quote, I guess, from the board panel decision, which is publicly available. Yes. Found a quote. So one of the cases, uh, matter of blue, it says that the board doesn't have to slavishly apply and utilize the guidelines. They are more so a reference tool. So the board, in and of itself, gives us these guidelines, and they are these standards that they are requiring all medical professionals to use, and then coincidentally having us to use them as well to for the board to be a trier of fact, arbiter of fact. Uh, determination of credibility of the medical opinions, and yet they're going to deviate them from them themselves and go against their own rules. Right, right. And, I, you know, I mean, far be it from me to really <laughs> talk about the use of that quote, like <laughs> that, that adverb slavishly, like I think it's just a <laughs> really poor choice of words there. But, hey, um, the the idea that guidelines are not, Right. Your word was Bible. They are our Bible because that's the reference point we have. But to just say, you know, in a vacuum, oh, but we don't have to follow them. Right. Still has to take us back to some foundation of, you know, normalcy or credibility. Right. So the claimant appeals. Right. And what what is what is the claimant's argument on appeal, Jeremy? What, what, first of all, he you have a 35 percent of a hand. After someone could potentially, and someone meaning us, right? The three of us are looking in this case saying, you, you shouldn't have even, you're lucky to get 35%, right? Based on our legal application of the guidelines. What is the claimant arguing on appeal? So the claimant is arguing that his own doctor's report is not credible because they applied the wrong guidelines. Uh, so he's like going against his own expert, what, right? Which is interesting because if I had looked at this case or to have been with our office, the first thing I would have said is both doctors applied the guidelines incorrectly. Let's just start over again. 
exactly. Right. You could do that. Uh, how about the fact that, you know, they have the ability to choose their own experts, right? In New York, if you can choose your own expert and then being mad at the report, it's kind of just like, well, what you made that choice, right? Like you, you're going to, you're basically saying the expert I chose was bad, right? And what is the, what does the court really do with this case then? So the court's, the court's uh, scope of review is really only whether the proper guidelines were applied. And they agree with him that it was improper to use those guidelines. And they essentially send it back uh, to the board saying uh, the board should, after accurately reviewing the existing medical evidence before it, determine anew the appropriate slew percentage. Okay. So interesting thing happens, right? Board panel affirms, right? So board panel says, I'm going to give you a 35% of the hand. The employer and the carrier have to pay that, right? Regardless of an appeal to the appellate division, which means that the claimant's now paid for 35%. And the claimant has to, in order to appeal and really expend that money, that means that they want more than 35%. And for defense now at this point saying, I'm going to invest in an appellate division rebuttal. How much do you think this claimant could have wanted for a schedule loss of use of the hand when he already got the benefit of a 35%. That's to me, that's a huge question here because as much as we have these litigation tools, a lot of our clients resolve schedule loss of use by taking this litigation leverage and stipulating out. So what do you, what do you guys think this claimant or this claimant's attorney, right? I'm looking at you, Connor, because you, you have some experience with him. A lot of experience. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think this guy could have asked for that the defense is going to say, you know what? No, we're going to invest. We're going to make a five figure investment in the appellate division litigation. You know, I've sat here and read through it, read through it and even read through uh, the claimant's attorney's brief. And it doesn't really make sense a lot of what he's really asking for. I mean, the only thing that I could think of is he was trying to, in a way, double dip to get double reimbursement in that he wanted the full slew of just the pinky, so the 100% of the pinky finger, plus the 50% or 35% of the hand. So not just the hand only, but get the hand and the finger, kind of go in and double dip, and maybe he tries to eventually come back and say, under a uh, 15-3V, like, oh, he's got 100% of his pinky. Possibly. Lose over 50%. So when those weeks run out, I can come back and try to get a classification because of his his slew impairment and grip and issues could be affecting his ability to earn a wage. It's like, I guess, so it has to be, it has got to be outrageous, right? For, uh, a defense team to think I'm going to invest in this appellate division litigation. The, the request to stipulate out must have been so outrageous that the number he was not willing to bend on. And I, I just, you know, people think about uh, what we do as, you know, it's like, Oh, you know, they're so litigation heavy. Right? They cause a lot of chaos. You know, they always, they're always fighting us on this. Um, we get that a lot from our opponents at hearings and trials, right? Or, you know, almost like this, this badge of honor that our firm gets for being uh, advocates for employers and carriers across, you know, the states that we defend. Uh, and here we have a situation where, you know, obviously we don't have access to this claim docket or more, or more so even the correspondence between the parties. But there is no chance that this defense team couldn't have made an outreach to the claimant's side and saying, what do you want to do to stipulate to, to a schedule loss of use of the hand before we dive in here, right? There's just no chance, right? That's not like, you know, a, uh, a lowest inspired idea to reach out to the other side for a resolution opportunity, Right. So I want to picture yourself, like put yourself in that position, guys, right? Like here is the defense team 
going to you as the claimant's attorney and saying like, what do we want to do? You're going to give a number that's so high that this decision has to go to its final end, right? Where we're literally talking about 2012 versus 2018, almost like the emotions of having to do it because the appeal itself, the guidelines were not used properly. That's actually correct, right? It's, you know, you you were mentioning it, Jeremy, like, why is it, why is the claimant correct that the, the guidelines were used incorrectly or why is it correct <laughs> that the wrong guidelines were used? As long as the initial permanency evaluation is after the 2018 guidelines were issued, right. then it's proper to use the 2018 guidelines as opposed to the 2012. Right. And we had this period, uh, what's it's now six years ago, right? Where if the permanency, the first permanency eval took place before the guidelines came into play, then you would use the 2012 version, right? And so for that like one year period, probably you actually had to litigate which guidelines were your, fa- your foundation, your source. This accident happened in January of 2020. Why both of these expert witnesses used a guidelines uh, version that had been outdated for three years beyond me, but the claimant's attorney is right. And so for the defense to even be involved in this is also another story, right? You can just let the workers compensation board handle this and then just walk away. But, uh, did you get the sense? Maybe, I mean, we don't know Connor, but did you get the sense from reading the briefs that the employer or carrier was incensed from, from, you know, um, like a, a standpoint of I'm going to fight you on this because your position is so wild or am I just talking crazy? Cause I, I mean, I could concede right now. This is just an idea that's coming to my head, right? Cause we have so many of these cases where we resolve them amicably, but how did it get here? Did you get the sense from reading those briefs that maybe there was some type of, I don't, I hate using the word emotional, even though I used it before, but sometime, some, some type of fight that sparks the senses a little bit. Yeah, I think so. I think even actually what it stems from really is uh, the claimant's attorney tried to seek penalties oh. against them for the 137 violation or another instance of 13A6 of improper communication with uh, the IME. And their whole basis for that was um, because of the unsolicited addendum that was submitted by Dr. Haher or Hayher, however you pronounce his name, uh, they were saying it was undue influence of the doctor to get him to change his opinions. And they were seeking penalty, and claimant's attorney was seeking penalties against the carrier uh, for that. So I think that probably had some of the emotional charge right, to it. Um, but reading through the brief, uh, the carrier's attorneys, you know, they were in agreement. They were just saying, let it, let it be as it is. Leave it at the 35% slew because it's equitable. Interesting. Another interesting point is that they're raising 137, essentially trying to get Dr. Haher's report precluded. But then after this happens, they're arguing the opposite, saying we want the extra 15% now. Right. So it's like a disingenuous argument. You want to ask for the employer and care to be hit with penalties, but you still want the results of the opinion from the expert that, you know, is involved in those penalty arguments. Cake and eating it too, I think is how they say it. Right. I think it's not even just that. It's like going back to the, the bakery and saying, I want a, a second free cake. <laughs> like, yeah. like it's, it's a very, very wild disposition here only because of the impact that it has and not for the outcome, right? Like we can agree, okay, the wrong guidelines were used. I don't know why the board wouldn't just say that. For instance, let's say you're the board panel you're the administrative review division, you have this case on your hands, you can amicably find a 35% while also saying that the improper guidelines were used, right? Because the reason the appellate division is kicking this back is because the board relied on incorrect evidence, right? But if you're the board panel, and we've seen this plenty of times, where a board panel won't rely on any evidence, they'll make a finding, or they'll rely on the correct evidence to issue the ruling that they want. And so the mistake here was probably in my eyes, the board panel decision where they looked at the the trial judge 
And they said, both experts agree. What are you guys doing here? This is a 35% get out of my courtroom. That's like, that's like what I foresee or not foresee, but what I like retroactively see in that like decision-making point. So, um, okay. We have now the decision. What's going to happen on the trial level now, because it's going back there. I, if I was, so the, the, the appellate division, they, they allowed two things or is two instances of send it back to the board and let the board decide based on the evidence that's in there but also saying, hey, maybe we'll give each party a chance to produce new evidence to use the correct guidelines and to apply everything properly. Um, and then reading through some of the papers again, um, you know, if I'm the carrier in this instance, maybe I go gung-ho at this point, you know, get my pound of flesh, <laughs> go gung-ho and just argue for the pinky, like maybe a hundred percent slew the pinky and, and say nothing for the hand because in the, in the papers, the both sides in the statements of facts sections are, are noting that range of motion for the hand for the wrist and hand was normal range of motion of the other fingers were, was normal. So you could argue for a 0% slew of the hand and then it should only be the pinky because it, there is no loading aspect here because it's just one digit of the hand. So just basically argue on the papers, like, you know, the new evidence I'm going to submit is my legal argument. Go for essentially what you'd be saying is a 0% of the hand. I, I think the issue is that the claimant's allowed to get his new report. So if I'm the claimant, I go pay an IME doctor right. that I know is favorable. There's certain ones upstate who I'm not going to name. But <laughs> right. we go to them. They give us 70% loss of the use of the hand or something. I think that's also a key point, right? Like reading where uh, the law firms are from means that this claimant probably resides upstate, right? You have uh, a Syracuse appellant and an Albany defendant. So y- your thought might be from the claimant side, get a new expert as the new evidence. And what, what do you think's gonna, what do you think's gonna happen at that point? So the claimant gets a report. Would you then Connor, cause you, you're, your idea was a defense just to, hey, I'm going to make a legal argument. Would you stick with your legal argument there? Or would you let this report now like say, oh, should I get my own report now? What, what, do, what do we do? It depends. Oh, there we go. Just And that's because and running you to defend from day one. No. <laughs> right. No, no, no. What I mean by it depends is if the claim is going to produce is that like, I'm not going to say, let's go get let's go get a new report. Obviously, I want to see what this claimant produces first and yeah. then I'd make my determination because one of the things that I like to do in my, in all of my cl- cases and claims and what uh, my paralegal Cristal Caravanis does really effectively is we always look for ways to discredit the permanent uh, claimant's permanency opinion using the guidelines. That's our first stop. Whenever we get a permanency opinion, we go to the specific chapter that involves uh, you know, the specific body part, and we're looking for ways where we can discredit it on its face that maybe allows us to make the decision is, is it a cost, make that cost benefit analysis decision of, is it even worth spending the money to, to get an IME or attack him on his credibility and use of the guidelines and make a legal and then make the legal argument of, Hey, proper application, application of the guidelines is X, Y, and Z. Right. Right. I'm also wondering too, right? You're, th- this is now like you, they've, I don't want to say they've made case law because it's a very straightforward issue. It's more like the implications of it, like the background that we're discussing here today. Like if you're one of the litigants or if you're one of the involved parties of, you know, either the employer, the carrier, even the claimant, you're Googling this. And on third Friday in June, this is going to come up, right? <laughs> Can you imagine Googling this and them getting our ideas? And then litigating, litigating this case with like basically lowest ideas. That also is kind of funny to me. Um, so we have a situation now where you, so many different things are going to happen with this. To me, my takeaway is try to avoid like the extension of time in the case by finding legal arguments to close it 
earlier, right? I think we've all kind of talked about that uh, because, you know, I'm thinking to myself, if you have a January 2020 accident that by all accounts looks pretty severe, but he's reached MMI in May of 2021, so less than 18 months, I think most of our clients would call that maybe not a win, but it's not a loss, right? That he's at MMI before two years, right? How can we use that development to drive a closure instead of going through the normal route? I'm going to get this report. We're going to take depositions. The judge is going to issue a decision. We're going to appeal. You're going to appeal and all this stuff. How can we creatively find a way to close the case? So that's, that's my takeaway. I don't know if you guys have the same ones or different ones. I know we've been talking about this case for a couple of weeks now since it came out. Any final thoughts uh, for our listeners out there? I would say just always look at the veracity of the report. And if there's a way to get rid of it or attack the veracity, don't necessarily need to get your own opinion. Like assess it for what it is and make the arguments early because the problem is it's unclear whether they've ever made the proper arguments in the first place in this claim. Right. That's not, yeah. Like, let's say you find out that, you know, it doesn't apply the guidelines correctly. You can actually draft your IME cover letter, draft your discovery to the IME in a way that kind of shows that, right? Because you'd just be saying, right, like section blank of the guidelines says this, right? You know, it's almost like leading a horse to water a little bit. Uh, Connor, anything from you, final thoughts on this claim? Uh, I know you've been very uh, defense heavy just because uh, of the particular attorney uh, that's on the the, uh, claimant side in this one. Yeah, I'll try not to let personal bias, you know, sneak in. Uh, I watched the CLE about that. Um, No, I think, you know, always, always, always use and reference the guidelines whenever you can because that is your that is your ticket. In my in my opinion, and yes, I had the quote uh, from one of the the claims that it's just a useful criteria, and they're not going to use it all the time or follow it to a T. But from a defense standpoint, you should always be using the guidelines to a T to discredit because you have nothing else, right? Right. It's already an uphill battle for us in a in a sense, right? So it's using the law and everything that's, uh, you know, provided to us to our advantage and showing how the other side failed. <laughs> right. I'm going to assume that they do, right? I mean, like assuming that they at least will give us an opportunity because that's what uh, happens in most of these cases. I think that a real straightforward reading of this probably doesn't make it worthy of a podcast, but I think really the experience of litigating schedule loss of use, resolving them, analyzing the guidelines provides some real life to this type of uh, judicial opinion. So uh, for Jeremy Janis, for Connor Weatherington, my name is Christian Cison reminding you to defend from day one.